Hi, the fundamental theorem of calculus. Uh, I always think it's interesting that we are halfway through the course and we're just now learning the theorem that is fundamental to the class. Um, but, whatever. So here we are, the fundamental theorem of calculus. And uh, we have already talked about part one. And part one depends on your textbook. Your textbook may call this part two. But this is simply the area under a curve. Um, and we talked about this, if uh, big F is an antiderivative of little f, the way you evaluate a definite integral is you find the antiderivative, plug in the top number, minus, plug in the bottom number. And uh, that is part of your fundamental theorem of calculus. And we usually do that without even thinking about the fundamental theorem of calculus, but that is part of it. The other part of the fundamental theorem of calculus, and this is part that tends to trip people up, but it relates to... Uh, doing derivatives of antiderivatives, which really puts you in a big circle. You're taking the antiderivative, and then you're doing the derivative of that. So you should end up with basically what you start with. There are going to be some slight variations. But uh, if your function f is continuous, and g of x is defined by this integral, and uh, I use those words intentionally, this thing right here is what we will lovingly and affectionately refer to as an integral defined function. Oh, that's a funny looking define. That is an integral defined function. So uh, g of x is actually found by computing the area under the curve f uh, up to varying values of x. I could do the area from a to 4 or a to 5. And uh, g of x is the accumulation of area under the function f. Uh, well, if g is the antiderivative of f, then if I were to take the derivative of g, then I will simply get f back. And that is your fundamental theorem of calculus, the second part, where the derivative of the antiderivative basically spits back out what you started with. Uh, in short, what happens, and this is kind of the, the recipe way of doing it, is you take out the t's and you plug x back in. Um, so g prime of x is f of x. And we're going to do a few problems. Uh, let's do the first one. Whoops, I copied too much there. Let me get rid of that. That's going to bug me. There we go. All right, so the first problem it, it involves real numbers and stuff. So uh, g of x is this antiderivative, and I want you to find g prime of x. Well, if you are great at learning little bitty rules and stuff, and, the, and you may be thinking, well, I know that g prime of x, if g of x is this antiderivative, then the derivative of the antiderivative just gives you your original function back, except it will be in terms of x, whoops, instead of t. So it's going to be 3x squared minus 2x, and that is going to be your derivative of g. Uh, but maybe a way you can kind of see what happens, because a lot of people struggle with why does the variable change from t to x is where is this magic craziness coming from? <clears throat> and uh, what we could actually do is actually work this antiderivative as a normal antiderivative. Uh, so g of x is, well, if I did this antiderivative, the antiderivative of 3t squared is t cubed minus uh, the antiderivative of 2t is t squared, and we will evaluate it from 4 to x. And remember, this is what my function g is equal to. Uh, so then I'll keep working that out. When you evaluate a definite integral, you plug in the top number. So I'll plug in x. So that will be uh, x cubed minus x squared minus, now I'll plug in 4, 4 cubed, minus 4 squared, um, and I get g of x equals x cubed minus x squared, uh, 4, that should be 4 cubed, 4 cubed is 64, minus 4 squared is 16, that gives you 48, so minus 48. Now, that's g of x. I worked out the antiderivative, and I got g of x, but remember, I asked for g prime of x. This is why the variable changes, because when you evaluate the definite integral, you plug the t in, or the x in for the t's. So now the derivative of g, a derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The derivative of x squared is 2x, and the 48 goes away, which is essentially just took the x, and it substituted it in for the t's in the beginning. Notice we got the same answer when we worked it the long way, or when we just said, hey, this is a fundamental theorem problem, we'll just plug the x in for the t's. Uh, so this is when you're finding the derivative of an antiderivative. And I wanted to do uh, a few more of these. Seems simple enough, right? Just plug in the x. Wow! All right, uh, so let's see. Let's try this one. 
find g prime if this is my g function, so number one here, uh, g of x is the area from pi to x. And something I need to uh, point out is in order to do the fundamental theorem of calculus, uh, let me go back to this part. Uh, you must be going from constant to variable. You must go from constant to variable. Uh, so that's what we're looking at here. Uh, and this is pi is a constant to a variable. So the derivative of g is simply going to be, so we'll see g prime of x is simply going to be, we'll take the t out and plug x in its place. So it'll be sine of x. There's your answer. Isn't that nice? Isn't that nice? Uh, what about this one? The area from 5 to x, that's constant to variable. So g prime of x, we simply take the x and it substitutes in for the t. Even if there's more than one t, we substitute the x in for all of them. So that would be uh, the ln of x squared plus 1 minus the square root of x. And that would be the derivative of g. g is an antiderivative, so if you do the derivative of an antiderivative, it puts you in a big circle and you just end up right where you started. Uh, let's try number 3 here. Uh, ooh, this one, notice it's x to 7. It's not 7 to x. You want the constant on bottom. Uh, well, I know how to flip the limits of an integral. This would be much nicer if it was from 7 to x, and I can do that as long as you make it negative. We change the sign. So this is the same thing as negative integral 7 to x of c cubed plus 5. And then my derivative, g to the prime of x, is going to be um, negative, and then I'll plug x in for the t. Square root of x cubed plus 5. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, now number four is where it's going to start getting a little bit trickier because now it's not just a constant to x, it's to x squared. I've muddied the water a little bit. And I'm going to be a bad teacher here in a second. I'm just going to show you how to do it. I'm going to ask you to ex ex that, accept this by faith. And we will talk about the nuts and bolts in class and maybe talk about why this is why it is. Um, so if, if it's something like this, we're going from constant to variable, the way we're going to do this derivative, it's going to start off exactly like you would expect. You're going to take the x squared and you substitute it in for the t. So instead of sine of square root t, it's going to be sine of the square root of x squared. Uh, and I know the square root of x squared cleans up, but you know, really, that, that was an accident. Um, but we're going to pretend that doesn't clean up, and it doesn't help you if it cleans up anyway. So we're going to leave that as sine of the square root of x. But what we have to do now is we multiply the whole thing by the derivative of what you plug in. So I plugged in an x squared. Um, so when I plugged in an x squared, I now need to multiply by the derivative of the inside. Uh, and we technically have been doing that. I plugged in an x. If you multiply by the derivative of what you plug in, that'd just be a 1. And that's what we've been doing so far. But if your function is something a little bit uglier, you plug it in just like normal, but then it turns into something like a chain rule where you multiply by the derivative of the inside or what you plugged into the function. Um, so I'm going to adjust part 2. Uh, where instead of g of x goes from a constant to just x, I'm going to go from constant to some function where you still plug in the function for your t. So I plugged in my function for my t. The only thing is you have to remember to multiply by the derivative of what you plug in. Um, and then there's one more example I wanted to do here. Uh, and this one is the trickier one. And again, I'm going to be a bad teacher. I'm just going to show you how to do this, and I hope you just accept it by faith, and we'll talk about the nuts and bolts later. But this one, I don't have the option to go from constant to variable. But, um, we could split this up, and we could do some interesting things, which I'll show you that in class. But for now, I'm just going to show you the, the how, and we'll t talk about the why later. Uh, when you have a problem like this, the derivative, g prime of x, what I'm going to do is you start with the top one, and I'll plug in my x cubed. So it's going to be the square root, if I'm doing the derivative, that would be the square root of the ln of x cubed squared, right? So I plugged in the x cubed. Maybe I'll color code this, color code this. So I'm plugging in x cubed first, 
And then we multiply by the derivative of what I plug in. So I did the top one. I plugged in x cubed, multiply by the derivative of what you plug in. Then, from that, we will subtract, and we will plug in the bottom one. So now I'm going to plug in x for my t. So that's going to be the square root of the ln of, and I'm going to take out the t, and I'm going to plug in x squared times the derivative of what I plugged in, which is just going to be 1. And then we're done. So it's the top multiplied by the derivative minus the bottom, a lot like evaluating a definite integral where you do top minus bottom, only here we're not doing the antiderivative first. We're just um, we're doing the derivative of g, where we just plug it in. Um, so that's kind of bad teaching because I'm not showing you the, the hows and, and the whys, or I'm not showing you the why, I'm only showing you the how. Um, so that's what you do. You plug in the top one, multiply by the derivative of the inside, minus plug in the bottom one. Uh, so I will, again, re-redefine part two. And now it's getting really crazy, but if g is uh, something like this, wow, this got a lot hairier than I expected. Um, you start with the top, so we're going to plug in r, r of x for t, then multiply by the derivative of the inside. So I plugged in r of x, and then I multiplied by the derivative. And then we did minus and plug in p of x for t. I plugged in p of x and multiplied by the derivative of what I plugged in. And that is your second part of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we will use this to answer some crazy, crazy problems.